Okay. All right, guys. Thanks, everybody, for joining me this evening. We're back at it. We're going to discuss. We're going to discuss Egrisel and kind of what it means. It's a um, it's a fairly important discussion, and about anything that has to do with heathenry, um, will of a necessity make a mention of this tree. And the first thing we want to discuss is is the name. I mean, there's a lot of conjecture about the name, what it means, what it comes from. Um, Most people today that I, that I deal with that have any kind of scholarly idea about it will will refer to the the, the Yggdrasil as a yew tree, which seems to be a favorite tree. It is an evergreen, and there was some confusion when, in the translation, but by and large, we uh, we don't really think of it as an ash anymore, like like they used to when I first uh, started looking at all this. Nowadays. It's kind of this understanding that it is the yew tree. The yew tree is this all over Europe. There are there are old churches, and in the middle of this churchyard, there'll be a yew tree. And some of, and the yew tree is an amazing thing. It, some of them are so hollow they actually have windows in them and seats, and they have, and they hold services in them. And they're very ancient trees, long lived trees. Um, some of them, they there's even a little project to go through and date how old these yew trees are. Um, the interesting thing about them is that they also give off a um, kind of a toxic fume in the heat of the summertime. Everyone has smelled pine before. But when you get next to a yew tree, uh, it's a little bit more of a heady intoxicant in the summertime. It produces certain compounds that will affect the brain. And there has been some connection, though I'm not sure how legitimate it is, but it is present that this, this is the kind of intoxicating thing that would allow someone like Odin hanging from a yew tree to see his ancestors and to pick up the runes. This uh, alternative state of mind caused by, a, by this substance. It's also a toxic wood, it's also a strong wood. They make bows out of it. Um, so there's a, lot of, there's a lot more use for that tree than people would think. It's also a very beautiful wood. It's a gold wood in some of them that you open it up. And the, and the wood is toxic. I mean, it will make you sick <laughs> if you uh, work with it and breathe in the dust, so on and so forth. So it's this interesting tree that I, that I think when we look at the body of evidence, the yew tree is far more what we need to be talking about as opposed to just an ash tree. Ash and the elm being ask and embla, if a creation of man, the, the um, carved from the wood. I don't think it would be the same ash that Odin would carve a new image of himself, one that's fitting to rule Asgard, but be that as it may. He said, then said Ganglary, where is the chief abode or holy place of the gods? Har answered, hi, that is the ash of Yggdrasil. And it, the translation is Asgard Yggdrasil. So it, uh, that's where the confusion comes in, but it is the you of Yggdrasil. There the gods must give judgment every day. So there's kind of a must there. There's an obligation on their part to do their, their half of the business of this uh, existence as much as we have. Then Ganglary asked, what is to be said concerning the place? Then said half and yard, just as high. The, the ash is greatest to all trees and best. Its limbs spread out all over the world and stand above heaven. Three roots of the tree uphold it and stand exceeding broad, one is among the Aesir, another among the Rime Giants. And in that place where aforetime was the yawning void, the third stands over Niflheim, and under that root is Virgilmir, the bubbling, the bubbling cauldron, and the bubbling spring, and Nidhogg gnaws the root from below. But under that root which turns toward the Rime Giants is Mimir's well, wherein wisdom and understanding are stored. Now that's, why would a Rime Giant have a well full of wisdom. Although it's not an unheard of idea. We also see when, uh, when Suttinger or Gillinger gets, his, gets the meat of inspiration from the dwarves, he kind of stows it away too. He doesn't drink it. He just kind of puts it away because, well, he, he has it within himself. And I think there's a, an interesting parallel to be drawn there when we look at the gods coming from this Jotun stock, they all have the potential to become something more. They all have something stored away within them. They all have something, and just like we do, we have something 
within us that can be developed into something to make us more than what we currently are. And I think this is the same principle here. I'm sure that there's much more to it, but for the purposes of this discussion, this is about as far as I'm gonna go with it. Under, under the bubbling cauldron, the origination of all rings, there's this great dragon that gnaws on the roots from below. But under that root that goes towards the rhyme giants is Mimer's well, wearing wisdom and understanding our story. He is called Mimer, who keeps the well. He is full of ancient lore since he drinks from the well of Gjallarhorn. Thither came, thither came all father and craved one drink of the well, but he got it not until he had laid his eye in pledge. So says the Valus, but all no I owe them. Where the eye thou hittest, in the wide renowned well of Mimir. Mimir drinks mead every morning from Valfather's wage, but ye yet are what? The third root of the ash stands in heaven, and under that root is the well which is very holy. That is called the well of Erd. There the gods hold their tribunal, and each day the Aesir ride thither up over Bifrost, which is also called the Aesir's Bridge. These are the names of the Aesir's steed, Sleipnir is best, which Odin has. He has eight feet. Now that symbol of a horse that has eight feet is not unique to our northern heritage. It's also present on um, some very ancient art in China and Korea. And it is a horse that represents the eight legs of the individuals that carry a man to be to his, to his burial place. That gallows tree, Odin's Igg's steed, uh, there's a very interesting connotation that kind of tie slight near that escorts to the realm, the underworld, and Helheim and Niflheim and all these other different realms that this eight-legged spider-like horse has the ability to go. But you may also access those realms through this tree, Yggdrasil. So I think they're intimately connected. The idea of a central pillar about which a group of people may gather is not unique to our lore either. The idea of a tree is present in mythologies all over Asia and Europe and Africa. Indeed, in Africa, it was a tree that could uproot itself and impregnated the first woman or something like that. But the idea of a great world tree, a central pillar around which we might gather and hold our things, this is, this is an important aspect of our ability or their ability to belong to a community. And I think when you gather, around, like even around people, that you see the little... The, the Christmas cards and the Yule cards where these, all these people gather around a central tree in the home, a highly decorated tree that represents so much light in the darkness. That's a very ancient tradition and a very ancient idea in our minds that we might find some kind of support, as it were, in the darkest of times, some kind of central pillar for our lives where the right things might emerge, where the greatest of wisdom, where the fate of our lives might come from, where the best judgments might be given. This is the axis mundi. This is the up and down. This is from the roots all the way up to the very high-minded ideals of the Aesir. And it's also present if you look at Kundalini yogas. There's a central, there's a central element to our being that, that goes up from the very base aspects of the central portion of the body through the heart, through the throat, the things we say, that idea of posy, through the things we think, and then one above that. <laughs> the idea of a central column around, it also emerges as the airman soul on the continent. This idea that there is one element, one idea, one solid structure that we might trust and rely upon, that we can gather around to develop a sense of belonging is one of those things that I think we sometimes miss. You see, there's so much of a person's existence that is something to do with wanting to belong to something larger than themselves. This expression of the divine manifests itself as a desire to belong to people. Even with the latest research on addiction, you see the, the, the old uh, the TED talk. I don't know the fellow's name, but it's a pretty good one. He, he talks about how the first research on addiction was that they put one rat in a cage and he would, he would uh, have water and heroin or cocaine and a little vial and he would do either or until he died, but he would just leave the water alone, sticking exclusively to the, the narcotic. Well, later research has found that if you put a group of rats in a cage, they won't fool with it at all. 
they have a sense of belonging to each other that supersedes that base condition of needing to escape what's going on around them. So when we look at that with people and we find ourselves centered around this great you tree, this great idea that is a doorway, it is a passage, it is an avenue for growth. I think we need to be paying real close attention to how we make the decision about who belongs and who doesn't. Because when we set it up as an us against them, this is the shallowest form of kind of connection, us against them. When you gather a group of people together that are focused exclusively upon their association is, is focused exclusively upon what they hate, it never lasts. I've yet to see it one time carry forward past a few years, maybe a decade for the real hardcore individual who derives his entire identity from it. But you can only make a connection with someone that goes so far based upon what you both hate. And there's no real sense of belonging in that. And it's certainly not something that's going to be, that's going to help you move upwards up the tree of Yggdrasil with regards to your thought. See, the Theosophy Trust put out something years ago called Yggdrasil and the Norns. I thought it was brilliant, um, a brilliant idea concerning Yggdrasil. And of course, he kind of spun it over into Aryan and Hindu ideas. We need to be real clear about the timeline of the Hindu ideas. When the Aryan migration or the, to have people from Aryan nations filtered into these areas, they're the ones that wrote down oral traditions that were many thousands of years older already than what the than Aryans wrote. They didn't make it up, what I'm trying to say. They simply copied it and put it in words. I think we get confused and try to try to make that our own when it's not. Yes, there's a lot of similarities, but there's a lot of similarities in a lot of mythologies. There is an expression of the human idea that transcends uh, a lot of this, but be that as it may, that's an argument for another time. But it says here in the, in the Veluspa, and Ash, I know Yggdrasil its name, with water white is the great tree wet. Thence come the dews that fall in the dales, green by earth's well, does it ever grow? And then it stands a Torna of the Veluspa after he's made Ask and Embla, after they've created all of these nine realms, after they've established uh, Midgard, after all of this has taken place, thence come the maidens, mighty in wisdom, three from the dwelling down neath the tree. Earth is one name, the Vrathandi the next. On the wood they score and scold the third. Laws they made there and life allotted to the sons of men and set their fate. When you look at the very structure of a tree, you have this, this living being, this, this living creature moves much slower than we do and yet it is still very much alive. They, they communicate, they send information to each other along their roots about who's short on what mineral. They are connected, they are a forest. Some of the largest living organisms in the world are the groves of aspen that grow on the, on the front, on the, uh, eastern front of the uh, Rocky Mountains. They're all connected. They, they communicate through amazing, um, it's an amazing thing. It's a study done in British Columbia, how these great trees communicate with each other. They're, they understand the signals of stress from one tree to the next and resources are allotted and sent in that direction. Who would have ever thought something like that would be possible? And yet here we're looking at Igrasil, after Odin has gone on his journey, after Odin has sacrificed himself, as he's hanging at literally death's door, then come three maidens that handle the daily business of allotting life to the sons of men and set their fates. Those Norns that talk about the, the past, the present, and the future, there are a lot of ideas with that, but when you look at the tree, when you start at the bottom, the tree gathers all of these minerals and ideas and, and nutrients and send them up through the tree of transpiration, just like we do. Our thoughts should continually be rising to higher and higher ideals. 
And every time we get stuck on an idea or something that happens in our life, if we're walking through our life like, like nutrients rising through the tree, and we come across something that happens to us and we become the victim, we, uh, our whole thoughts center around that, like the 70-year-old man still talking about playing high school football. That becomes his identity. That's all he talks about. Well, my goodness, there's 60 years in there. Hasn't something better happened than just high school football? People that have suffered trauma, this typically becomes the, the, um, the center of their identity. Well, isn't there something, can't we choose a different 10 minutes? Je uh, Justin Garcia and I were talking about that. But on Igrisil, let's say that material didn't come up. And just like Odin, he gets stuck to the tree in that spot. And he gets stuck in that spot until the point of almost death. And as people move through life, there are things that happen in our world that stick us in place. Our thoughts drift back to that time again and again and again. And each time our body sends nutrients and chemicals and all this stuff because the body doesn't know that what the mind is thinking isn't really happening. And it responds as if it's actually there. Our palms get sweaty. Our muscles tighten up. We begin to sweat. We get nervous. Well, we become afraid. Chemicals begin to flow through our body. And in some case, in matter of fact, in most cases, like that mouse that's by itself, it will continue to feed off of that poison until it dies. We become a great knot in that tree. Anytime there's a blockage in the flow of nutrients up a tree, there shows a scar or a great burrow or some kind of knot in that tree and we lose the ability to move forward up through the tree into the leaves and out of the leaves as transpirate as uh, enduring photosynthesis and come out as oxygen, something radically different than the nutrients that that tree picked up in the ground. It would be the same thing with us. What happens when we pass through that doorway is so radically different, our minds can't even begin to conceive of it. We have hints, we have suggestions, we have ideas, but we don't know, but whatever the case may be, this is what happens. In life, people find an idea or some situation and they form a great knot on their own pattern of growth. And all forward momentum stops. So Skuld, who has this empty plate and is waiting on down the road for us, we're the ones responsible for filling up that plate with the with the fruits of our efforts, with the fruits of our labors, with what we want to harvest, with the ideas we want to be, that image that we create in our minds of where we want to be in five or 10 years. Skull is the one that holds that plate ready for us. She's not going to fill it up. That's our responsibility as they allot the lives of men. There's a hundred variables in the allocation of a man's life. If he stops in his growth, because of some trauma that's happened in the past or some abuse that's happened to a woman in the past or some denigration of what we perceive as our identity, all growth stops. And yet every day we start anew, every day the Norns water that tree of Yggdrasil with, with the white dew of the Dales. We have the same opportunity to find ourselves around a central pillar celebrating this Axis money, doing our best to move up and forward through it and over it and around it, but to do better than we did the day before. And that example is throughout the lore, throughout, the, uh, throughout this example of Yggdrasil. See, because Yggdrasil doesn't stand tall, just waving in the wind like a giant redwood, hey, I'm good to go, you can't fool with me. He has Hythrin, the goat, who stands by here Father's Hall, and the branches of Lareth she bites. The pitcher she fills with fair, clear mead never fails the foaming drink. So there's one goat eating in the tree, one heart. Ithric Mir is the heart who stands by here Father's Hall, and from the branches of Lareth he bites. So you have a goat, and I think there's four hearts that are eating in this tree. It's constantly suffering setback. It's constantly suffering damage. It's being, its leaves are being gnawed upon. Its roots are being gnawed upon. There's an eagle that sits in the top, and there's a squirrel that runs up and down this thing, stirring, stirring the pot between the high-minded ideals of the mind 
and the very base instincts of the simple human individual. All day long, every day, stir in the pot. And that's how it goes with us too. We constantly have to struggle with, hey, Steph, you close that. All day long, we have to struggle with the style, the type, the origination of the thoughts that we think. There are our thoughts, it's our mind. If we can't control the thoughts that we think, who can? It names the rivers here in the in this in this in the in the grimness mall too, Sith and Vith, Sek and Adek and Zval and Fimbulthal, Gunthro and Fjorm, Grin and Renandi, Gipal and Gopal, Gomal and Ger Gervimul, that flow through the fields of the gods. Thine and Vine, Thol and Hol, Groth and Gyothorn, Vino is one, Veg was in another. Gyol and Lept that go among men and hence they fall to hell. You know, I had a list of what all those names meant, but they, I don't. But the, the corn and Ormt and Kerlox twain shall Thor each day away through. When dooms to give, he forth shall go to the ash tree Egdrasil, for heaven's bridge burns all in flame and the sacred waters seethe. On these steeds the gods shall go. When dooms to give, each day they ride to the ash tree Egdrasil. So every day these gods are revisiting this central pillar that is crucial to the entirety of existence. Every day that central pillar is being washed anew with refreshing waters, the dews from the dale. Every day we wake up and have the opportunity to stand up and choose the thoughts we want to think, to associate with the people we want to associate with. Back to my original point of belonging, we have so many individuals that have decided to become a different being than 90% of what's wandering around the face of the earth. And we could provide almost limitless number of ideas as to why we are justified in doing so. There are scholarly ideas abound. There are philosophical ideas too, too numerous to count that give us reason as to justify our actions. But what would happen if we began to say, I choose to water the roots of my being each morning with new grand thoughts in the same manner that the gods do when they go to visit Yggdrasil and pass out judgment. There's an idea there that resonates so clearly. When we create an us against them mentality, we are taking an individual who has decided to go against the grain, who has decided to go it alone, who has decided to wander, as it were, in the same manner as Odin, and we are not offering them the kind of belonging that the 850 million Caucasians that populate this planet seem to be needing. How lonely it must be to be an atheist or an agnostic to absolutely completely give up on spiritual ideas because they cannot find a sense of belonging. And yet here we have these ancient tales that for thousands of years gathered people together on the coldest nights around a tree to celebrate the rebirth of life. Here we have an idea that it happens every single day. Every day when we stand up, we have the opportunity to not be stuck in place. A part of Odin had to die for him to not be stuck in place on that tree pierced by his own spear. A part of Odin had to be given up. And that's a scary thought for someone that comes in here looking for a sense of belonging. But what happens to me if I don't have that idea that I think my identity revolves around anymore? What will I become? Well, you continue to move up that tree. Who knows what it's going to look like? when the vitamins and nutrients and minerals that move up to the tree of who you are go out to the leaf and become something much different. I have no idea. But I do know that it happens, and it's happened for countless millennia, and people have believed in that for a reason. They have believed in this idea that there's something that we might that we might believe in more than ourselves, that we might gather around a central pillar. Three are the roots there are that three ways run, neath the ash tree Yggdrasil, neath, 
neath the first lives hell, neath the second the frost giant, neath the last are the lands of men. Ratatosk is the squirrel who there shall run on the ash tree Yggdrasil from above the words of the eagle he bears and tells them to Nithog beneath. Four hearts there are that the highest twigs stinker. Nibble with necks bent back, Dane and Deval and Dunir and Dirathror. So that's five hearts. More serpents there are beneath the ash than any unwise ape would think. Go and Imoan, Grafitnir sons, Grabak and Gravuluth, Wufnir and Zvafnir shall ever methinks gnaw at the twigs of the tree. Egrasil's ash, great evil suffers, far more than men do know. Do we not all struggle with thoughts of things we might have done better? Some failing we may have had in the past, some standard we aren't living up to now? How do we, do we suffer, do we deal with that quietly? That ash, that you, great evil suffers far more than men do know, and yet every day its roots are renewed. The heart bites its top, its trunk is rotting, Nithog gnaws beneath. And sometimes when an individual decides to follow one of these paths, that might be exactly how they feel. Their thoughts are a mess, their trunk is rotting, and the ideas that held them up through, that, that propped them up to move forward to the world, they're just barely there. And what do we do when they show up? I think it's a great disservice to anyone that shows up into this ideology and say, well, if you don't really believe this way, you're not quite, you don't really understand the heathen worldview. If you don't hate this group or that group, or you're not as intent on dehumanizing this organization over here as this organization over here, well, you're really not as good a heathen as I am. And I probably know a little bit more than you do. And we rob that individual who might be hanging by a thread, who may have found a wide new broad horizon, who might show us some grand new vision, either or it's flipped two sides of the same coin. There's some kind of wonder to be had, either growth or a new vision from those individuals that show up. And we put a condition upon that sense of belonging. Well, what good does that do? When these people are out here wandering in the wilderness like Odin, searching for the songs of their ancestors and the runes, to encourage them to hate because someone thinks they hate, <laughs> what an asinine idea all the way around. We're going to reclaim these symbols from those that hate. I'm going to sign deck 127. You have an opportunity to be free of whatever it is you think someone hates. And the first thing we do as we approach this new life is embrace a new pattern of hate. All we're doing is taking old ideas and giving them a fresh coat of paint and justifying our action because, well, they're Vikings, you know, I'm blah, blah, blah. So when we look at Igrisil, there's an idea that's encapsulated in that idea, that axis Monday of man moving from this base existence to one of a greater experience, that doorway that, with the sun-facing goddess that we all must face, because one of those roots is in her realm. So we have her to contend with as well. And the Gallerhorn, the new one talk about Odin's sacrifice of an eye for wisdom. He, he sacrificed the ability to see so he might know all things. The Galar horn has also been told, called the shrieking horn, that thing that people held up to their ear. Um, Heimdall sacrificed an ear so that he might see all things. So there's an interesting uh, parallel drawn there. I, I forgot the late name of the lady that came up with that idea, but it's a very sound one. Um, to make that sacrifice to know all things, to see all things, the warder of heaven, the king of Asgard, the ruler of the Aesir, these sacrifices, what, by that example, what do we think we might have to sacrifice so that we might create that sense of belonging that so many people so desperately need? 
if we are ever to become anything more than a footnote in the annals of history, I think our best bet might be to set aside some of those ideas that simply power righteous indignation and do our best to start emulating this example of these gods coming to support this great wounded tree every day, these norns that give it fresh water due from the dales every morning. Should we not expect the same thing if we're putting one foot in front of the other? Should we not expect the same thing if every day we try to do something a little bit better than we did the day before? Should we not expect that same kind of support? You, even understanding the basic idea of the gifts that we have, we are the central pillar of our own lives. We are the star of our own show. If the greatest thought we might come up with is that we might create a situation where lots of people think well of us, we're really missing the point. Be the star of your own show. Create that sense of identity and belonging within yourself first, and then you might find how we might belong to each other. And we can't do that based upon the limiting ideas of any kind of hate. When these gods made sacrifices of certain ideals, parts of themselves to become something more, is something we have an obligation to emulate. There is something that we must sacrifice for us to move forward. Some kind of limiting ideal, some kind of paralyzing thought process, some kind of emotional baggage that's keeping us from becoming more. And every day we gotta get up, throw some water on our face, and try again. When you look at Egrisil, we don't need to get into some esoteric ideology or get too carried away with the etymology to see that that great tree is a daily representation of the hope, the effort, the support, the commitment of the gods to us. And the same idea as a Yule tree shines in the dark in the middle of winter, the shortest day of the year. It's the same simple principle. And I don't know about y'all, but there's some very special memories I have of standing around a Christmas tree as a child on the shortest night of the year having hope, excitement, unmitigated joy that there was some kind of new thing for this child, this young man, this, this token that his parents might really care for him. Many of us still should hold those memories. Now all of a sudden we see it in this ancient mythology that the same principle stands true. The tree may not make it. Hey, it might be artificial and light up by plugging it into the wall, but it's still a damn tree. <laughs> you still have that idea that these great beings have given a commitment of themselves to help us move forward in the world. Rig walked through and by generations or by classes gave all of these children and grandchildren a set of instructions for ceremony that we see resonate with Sigrid and Brunhild. The children have these ideas of how these names that represent the things that build societies. We see Balder and Forseti that uh, established as above, so below with regards to the justice systems and legal system. What might a free man do who has all of these tools to build society? What might he create if he trusted and believed in a fair and equitable judgment on his behalf or in the community around that great tree where everyone belongs? What happens if we have Kavassir that comes and shared with everyone the wisdom of how to make it happen? that key to unlocking all of that great potential that lies in the ideas of Posey, the words that we might speak that create within our imagination and paint across our minds that great canvas of imagination, what it might be like for the divine to come to this world in song and in art and in the things we say to each other that help us want to be a part of each other's lives, to stand around that central tree and move forward and become something greater. That's what all of this is about. Because at the very beginning, the very outset, we were given good sense and, and tools to use to be, be something more than a couple of idiots stumbling along the road. When you look at it in those terms and then see that there's a place, there's a powerful example, there is that central pillar, the axis mundi, that great central idea around which we might revolve, that we might move forward in the world I can think of no better place, no better tool, no better ideology, faith, or spirituality that might help save us from some of the things that we're troubled with, that might help cultivate this idea of Western civilization. When I talked with Sydney earlier, I couldn't stand, I couldn't help but be impressed by the passion with which she holds her ideas. 
when will we hold our ideas too? When will we hold the same passion about our ideas that do not revolve around how right we are? That every day as we get up in the morning, put the water on our face, put one foot in front of the others, be reminded that the gods are doing the same thing on our behalf. Be reminded that that tree upon which we lean, that we might rest under its shade if we're weary, uh, it's being watered, that lives and, and fates are being allotted, and that that empty plate that skull holds under that tree, it's our obligation and we have a chance to fill it. What are we gonna fill it with? We're gonna fill it with those great good things that fulfill us? Or are we gonna fill it with a poisonous dish designed to make others sick? I think right now that's about all I got for Yggdrasil, but I hope that you guys enjoyed that very much because I kind of enjoyed it. <laughs> I'll tie it all together in a book and it'll come out good. <laughs> Thank you guys for joining me tonight. If uh, anybody, let's see here. If anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them or, or talk with you a little bit. It wouldn't be no problem. I got a couple of minutes. Matter of fact, I don't have to be at work tomorrow because it's Labor Day, so I feel pretty special. And if you haven't checked out my interview with Steve McNallan, um, please do. I mean, he's a, I've known Steve for, Steve for several years and, <laughs> and he's, he's, uh, I mean, he is the guy that started it all. And the interview with Sydney, I, there were some problems with the video, but you know, here's, they're following this Hellenistic path that is all of these Greek gods. And all of a sudden I'm looking at this and I'm like, my gosh, this, this idea that we're going to become something more is, is literally bubbling like the Herveglum here, the bubbling cauldron at the base of Yggdrasil. And it's coming up in all kinds of different ways. Again and again, we're given this opportunity to say, hey, we got you, man. Get up. Let's try it again. You know, I think in the world that we live in today, there's a real obligation to grab a hold of that, like men, like women and really stand up and be something. I mean, I see all kinds of reassurance in that. Maybe it's because I want to see it, I don't know. But I do see things that if someone calls me and say, Brian, I don't think I can make it another minute. Um, I see something in there that I can offer to someone to help them put another foot forward for, for 10 more minutes. And if you can wait 10 more minutes or choose a different 10 minutes in your life, you can change the entire course of your existence. You can become something much more than anyone ever expected of us. And the thing about it is when you do it for yourself, when you do it because you want to belong to yourself first, you're not waiting on the conditional aspect of what everyone else's opinion is, you of, is, is of you to determine the quality of who you are. My gosh, what kind of freedom is there in that? So all, now all of a sudden in this very chaotic world full of radical ideologies and these people in the street spouting hate and bitching about this and whining about that, and putting all that energy out in the world. Our gods have thrown us a lifeline that we might become something more. It's a no brainer to me. Hell, I got this. You know what I mean? I don't know. Maybe that's just walking too many road marchers. I don't know. <laughs> all right. You guys have a good night. I think I've, I'm, I'm done. You can go ahead and stop recording. I, I'm, I'm doing that. ain't I, <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys. Have a good.